So Ed Kamal, one of the key things which is noted by the EU27 is that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. So this whole transition deal, which hopefully we signed off today, might come to nothing. Do you think that's a possibility or likely or something that should be considered still? Well, I think when I speak to my colleagues from other EU countries and speak to many of the ministers and prime ministers, they say to me, look, side, this is the way the EU works, that we will ha we'll have all our positioning, we'll beat, you know, we'll, we'll beat our chests, we'll say, well, that's impossible, we can't achieve a deal. But at the end of the deal, we, at the end of the day, both sides want a deal. And actually, that's in our interest. There'll be lots of games played before then, there'll be lots of positioning, lots of you know, posturing, but there will be a deal. And you mentioned their games played. Obviously, Donald Tusk, the uh, president of the European Council, in his uh, letter, well, article said, well, I have just recommended to our leaders that we welcome, in principle, the agreement on the transition. Now, that to keep him in principle, does that indicate that there is still a lot of movement to be had in this transition arrangement? Well, think about it. If you hadn't used the word in principle, would you, all you guys be here now thinking actually what's going to happen at the, at the summit today? You always have to have that level of uncertainty until, until it's agreed. Um, but it's quite clear from me speaking to MEPs from other countries, speaking to ministers and others, that they want to move on now to the future. We've talked about the past long enough. You know, we can't carry on replaying the referendum. Both sides want to move on to the future relationship. Now, one thing which is causing a lot of turbulence rather at home, particularly for some Conservative MPs, is, is some of the concessions that have been offered as part of this transition deal, particularly staying in the common fisheries policy and limiting the transition period as well to 21 months. What's your take on, on the concessions the UK government have been prepared to go down, particularly, let's say, the fisheries, uh, in order to get to this point? Well, in any negotiations, you go into a room with your asks, you trade things off and you actually have concessions on both sides. So we've seen concessions from the EU. The EU has now put in at the behest of the Luxembourgs and the others a, a, a financial services chapter. They've said actually the UK can sign its own trade deals within a transition period. These are, these are massive uh, concessions from the EU. On the same time, actually, I think we have to focus on the bigger prize. Of course, like most people, I would have preferred that we ended our involvement in the CFP as soon as possible. But actually, as part of the compromise, what's happening is that we will maintain our existing quotas until 2020. We will be at the table for, for the future discussions. But when we leave after transition period, we will be in control of British waters. We're really, in effect, waiting eight, one year more for, for the bigger deal. Do you think there's an aspect uh, in terms of the UK strategy that they've been prepared to perhaps concede more in the transition negotiations in the hope that for the future relationship, the EU will be more willing to ha perhaps concede more than they have done now? Do you think the UK has, in, in this sort of transition deal, actually given away more than the EU and done that strategically? Actually, I'm, interesting enough, I'm hearing criticisms from some of my EU colleagues that the EU's given away too much. So I think what you're seeing here is basically what you see in any negotiations. Compromises are being made. Some people are going to be happy with those compromises. Some people want to take a harder line. And both sides have made concessions. Now let's talk about the Irish border. Now that is still reportedly an issue of massive uh, space to be filled in terms of compromise. Uh, Theresa May and Leo Varadkar are reportedly having a bilateral meeting uh, this evening. What should we expect, if anything, from today, these meetings between these two leaders? Is there going to be any movement here? Has there been any progress uh, you know, from what you're hearing? You've got to look at this within the background of the Irish elections. Uh, Lavarica is due an election at the moment by being seen to be tough at home um, in, in the run-up to the December Council. He opened up a, a lead in the opinion polls. This issue plays well for him in Ireland and does him no harm to, to, to publicly bash the British. In private, though, there are discussions going on about actually how do we resolve this issue. Now, both sides know that there are technical solutions out there. Not, it doesn't mean a technical solution, say, on the Canadian-US border is the solution to, to the, the Irish issue, but there are solutions out there. They also both know that actually, even if they came to an agreement now on the Irish border, you've got to see that in the context of the wider EU-UK agreement. You can't really finally resolve the Irish border issue until you've got the uh, got a view of what the EU-UK relationship is, and they're and, and they're all intermingled. What about the issue of Gibraltar? Now it's been reported as well that Spain wants the legal the legal text to be clearer that it has a veto on Gibraltar continuing to enjoy the benefits of the single market and the customs union, having more say on the Gibraltar issue. Where do you see that going? Is that something where Spain is going to make a lot of noise and the EU is going to go nowhere with it, or is that going to be possibly? A real sticking point. No, I think it's all part once again of the negotiations. You throw in issues, you posture about things. You know, I've spoken to many Spanish MEPs and politicians who say Gibraltar is important to us, clearly, in the same way it's important to you as Brits. 
but actually we are not going to allow it to become the sticking point or a sticking point to a future relationship. The Spanish want a good relationship with the UK going forward, but actually they, of course, at this point they'll throw it in. And what's reassuring is that David Davis is having talks with his Spanish counterparts about resolving some of these issues at the moment. It's not a sticking point, it's a discussion point. Now, let's talk about the future relationship, because after Theresa May leaves today, tomorrow morning, the EU27 are going to meet down, uh, sit down and, and thresh out some kind of negotiating principle for the future arrangement. Now, managed divergence or managed alignment or whatever you want to call it, there still fundamentally seems to be this idea of cherry picking and there's a barrier in terms of what actually a future arrangement is going to look like. Do you feel that there's been a softening and that we're all moving towards a centre ground or do you still think that the EU perhaps are being less creative than they need to in order to forge this deep and special partnership? Well, I think for the EU, they're in a new area here when it comes to a, a trade agreement because they're not negotiating with, a, a, say, a Singapore, Malaysia or US here. They're negotiating with a country that was a member of the EU. And what many colleagues here say to me is that if Britain was never a member of the EU, but the EU is next door to the world's fifth or sixth largest economy, the UK, of course they'd want to do a trade deal with them. But the problem is that we are mem for them, we are members now, and, and what they're worried about is giving us a deal that is se seen to be better than membership in their, in their eyes. So what we're starting with, we're not agreeing what to put into a trade agreement, we're actually agreeing what to take out. And managing divergence is actually something that they don't usually do in trade agreements. That's where the challenge is. And in terms of the softening of the stance, because there's been a lot of rhetoric, particularly from someone like Donald Tusk, the council president, Jean-Claude Juncker, the, the commission president, also Michel Barnier, the EU's chief negotiator, that no cherry picking shall be allowed in terms of access to the single market and the benefits of the single market without a, a meeting the rules and regulations. Do you think in reality we're going to start seeing a softening of that position and it's starting to become a lot more fluid and a little bit more che cherry picking on both sides? I think it will be seen as, I think it will be more fluid, but I think both sides will want to avoid the accusation of cherry picking. And so what you will do, you will come up with a pragmatic relationship. It's interesting, for example, at the beginning, anyone who talked about the UK having a financial services chapter in the agreement was, was, was accused of cherry picking. Now the EU has actually said in its draft guidelines in the annex that we are going to start talking about financial services. That's moved away from being cherry picking to the future relationship. So you'll, you might see what people would consider cherry picking now, but actually the language will change. Let's just talk about what's in the news this morning, which is to do with these passports and who's going to be making the passports, the famous blue passports when they come back. Franco-Dutch company will provide the blue passports, or rather is the front runner. No British company is going to be making British passports. Some, some of uh, the MPs in the Commons, such as Sir Bill Cash, says this is symbolically completely wrong. What's your take on it? Well, first of all, the, the contract hasn't been awarded yet, and it's a bit premature to say whether who's got the contract. But even if this Franco-Dutch company got the contract, you know, people who voted for Brexit who wanted a global Britain can hardly say that we wanted a global Britain, yet actually everything has to be made in Britain. I don't, when I say what my iPhone's necessarily made in Britain, why, you know, why would I argue about where my passports are made? Now, just before you go, Russia is, of course, on the agenda as well today as, as Brexit. Theresa May looking to get unified stance uh, from the EU regarding uh, Russia and the re alleged nerve agent attack in Salisbury in the UK. Boris Johnson comments, obviously, in some way comparing uh, the Russian World Cup, Football World Cup, to the Nazis in the 1930s and the Olympic Games in terms of propaganda. Was that a completely uh, you know, irresponsible thing for the Foreign Secretary, the man who's supposed to be fronting diplomacy for the UK, to be saying? Well, one thing I do know is that my colleagues from many Central and Eastern European countries have been saying to me for many years that us in Britain and people in other Western European countries do not take the Russian threat seriously enough. After Crimea, the way that they agitate the Russian minorities in those countries, my colleagues say you've got to take the Russian agitation more seriously. So, um, Bor so Boris Johnson was right in his assessment? All I'm saying is that what's important is that we take the Russian aggression more seriously and that we come to the United Front. Someone who perhaps has been under criticism today and indeed yesterday for, for perhaps being too soft on Russia is Junko Junko, the Commission President, after he sent a letter which was very, very complimentary and indeed congratulatory uh, to the Vladimir Putin after his presidential victory. How has that gone down in the EU? The reports are that it has not gone down well amongst nation states, but also just more generally in the EU. What, what's been your mood on that? I think the reports are accurate. They, it, hasn't, it hasn't gone down well. Um, and I thought it was very notable when uh, Tusk, Donald Tusk was asked about his view on, on congratulating Putin. 
and he said he certainly wasn't going to be congratulating Putin. There are many MEPs, there are many politicians around national capitals who think that we should not be congratulating Putin at the moment and that we should be taking the tougher stance. Why did he do it then? Well, I think Jean-Claude Juncker is Jean-Claude Juncker. I can't answer for why he does something or why he doesn't. You know, he's a character, you know, he, you know, he likes to be a bit of a lad. He's a character in a very important position. He's, he's a character in a very important position. I'm, I'm not defending Jean-Claude Juncker. I just know he did it, but actually he doesn't have a wide, as wide a support as he might think he has in, in this respect. Sajk Mel, thank you very much. Thank you.